Hi everyone. Uh, in this series of recorded lectures, I am going to cover more information about soil excavation, grading, and compaction of soil fills. Uh, we covered this topic in summary in the class and uh, this is more information and uh, also it will help you to do your project too which are series of important questions related to this topic. We are going to cover about earthwork construction and what are the really objective objectives for that. We are going to talk about soil compaction concepts which not only we apply in our design but we use them in our lab and field. We are going to discuss methods and equipment which includes six different steps excavation, transport, placement, moisture, addition, compaction and then final grading. We will also talk about difference between modified compaction test, standard compaction test. In fact in the lab some of you will do even reduce compaction test. Uh, then important aspect of this uh, subject matter is what are the field consideration and how do we really monitor what kind of con compaction is really achieved in the field. And then um, we will talk about some other fill other than just sand, gravel, silt and clay. And lab number one, I think we have shown you some lightweight fill material. We did show you geoform. We did show you some shredded tire and crushed glass. And now we are going to think about can we use these material as a construction material? And do they have the properties what we need uh, when we are thinking about a fill? So let's start with earthwork construction and objectives. Uh, it's not that recent time that we are um, placing fills and removing fills. And if we look at that uh, sketch here, uh, in order to build a structure right here, we need to remove certain amount of soil, which can be any kind of soil. And if that soil can be placed right here as a fill and compacted, that would be most wonderful case but many times we have to really see that whether this cut material is suitable as a fill material. And it depends on this fill material. This fill has to be stable. If we look at this case where this road has been made and definitely certain amount of soil was removed as a cut and certain amount of soil has been placed fill. And this fill has to be stable all the time during this operation of this road. One of the largest construction project uh, today is has been the Panama Canal project. And this is a typical cross section during the construction of Panama Canal. And what you see here is a very large cut which was 109 meter high. And you can just imagine making these kind of cut in a very complex geological setting. Uh, geology at that time was very not very advanced. There was no geotechnical engineering and rock was highly fractured and soils were all wearing nature. And this kind of construction really resulted in massive landslide, a very, very difficult um, construction. Many times the projects were stopped and geotechnical engineering really started when Carl Terzaghi started working on some of the aspect of Panama Canal project. Another way of transporting and placing a very large amount of fill uh, was uh, very popular in 1930s and 40s and this process is called hydraulic fill technique. And what hydraulic fill technique is that to build a dam, uh, soil is changed into slurry and this slurry is pumped in a form of a pipes. So as you can imagine, as the slurry is deposited, coarse grain particles will settle first and the finer finer particles will move here and if we are placing the slurry from this side and this side what will result in coarser soils here coarser soils here and eventually fine grain soils in the center which serves as a core of the dam many dams in this country and overseas were built using a process called hydraulic filling and at this time we found out this technique was really not wonderful and these kind of 
earth dams were quite susceptible to earthquake as it happened in uh, in California where lower San Fernando dam failed during an earthquake and when we think about amount of earth which is needed to build a earth dam and in this case this is Oroville dam this is a fairly large dam the height of the dam this is how we'd identify the size of the dam often is 225 meter and you can just imagine the amount of material and as, as stated is this we are talking, talking about millions of cubic meter of different type of soils including silt and clay for the core gravel and rock fill material which is placed to build a dam like this there are almost 44,000 dams many of them are earth dams and these earth dams range from 15 or 10 meter in height to 300 meter in height and all kind of soil materials are used to build these dams now let's take a minute and uh, not minute more than minute uh, and we need to talk about when we place earth material whether whether it's for embankment or is it for road what are really objectives so I will go one at a time earth fill material should have sufficient strength to start with and then it should be sufficiently stiff or strong so that it doesn't result into excessive settlement after the construction uh, and most important un under the wet condition if the water content changes if the fill gets saturated soil still should have strength and it should still be stiff this is very very important aspect and under some conditions fill should be have, should have low permeability this is typically true for when we are thinking about building soil liners or clay liners particularly for landfill covers or at the bottom of the landfill uh, in that required property is low permeability and so our fill should have low permeability um, and we think about weather condition particularly in northeast we must have non-frost susceptible fill otherwise it will change its uh, behavior now what I want you to think about what is really compaction and this definition is very very important to remember uh, compaction is the densification of soils all kind of soils by application of mechanical energy okay and this mechanical energy can be applied uh, through hammers or through vibrations or pressing the soils or kneeling the soils uh, but net result is that if we go back to looking at phase diagram these are the solids these are the water and the pores and this is the air and net result of the compaction is really reduction in in the air voids of the soil uh, we don't want to reduce the amount of water soil grains don't get reduced so what is really compaction compaction is to reduce air voids from the soil by application of mechanical energy and by reducing the air voids we improve engineering properties and what are these engineering properties let's look at the next slide uh, we increase the shear strength of the soil by densification we increase the bearing capacity of the soil by densification we reduce compressibility therefore the compactors will become stiffer which we want we reduce permeability so therefore they lead to less seepage of water through the compacted fill and we improve the frost susceptibility of the fill also by densification and last but not least uh, we also reduce the degree of shrinkage and formation of cracks particularly this is true for clay liners now this is a very interesting uh, actually the paper which was published in Canadian Geotechnical Journal uh, which is a very reputed journal um, many uh, places still use animals for densification of fill and one of the smartest animal is really elephant and so this is not in hypothetical case or fun case where there was a study done 
where they have wanted to fill certain amount of fill in an area and they wanted to train elephants to compact the soil but elephant is a very smart animal so what happens when elephants start walking uh, and another elephant follows so the second elephant will always follow the footstep of the first elephant so certain area of the site get really compacted where the animal is has weight is applied but remaining of the part rem remains uncompacted so this is uncompacted area and here is some data where this is from the field study which was reported in this paper and all the data points here shows the see these field compaction data and as you can see uh, this compaction really did not result to the standard proctor which they want to receive receive um, so it doesn't work very effectively but many old structures were compacted and some part of world we are still using animal elephant and sheep to compact fills now after having covered really what are the main goals to have soil densification and compaction uh, let's look at a little bit about the concept now theory of compaction was established by dr proctor in 1933 and he wrote a very simple paper in engineering record or news or some magazine and he clearly defined that there are five different variables which influences overall compaction the first is dry density or dry unit weight in this class we are using unit weight more than density water content in the second variable third variable is amount of compactive effort and here is the mechanical energy this is where the mechanical energy comes sorry my handwriting is not wonderful here mechanical energy fourth variable is type of soil and here the gradation of the soil whether soil is poorly graded or well graded and presence of clay minerals and amount of clay is very important then thickness of the fill or what we call in the field lift uh, being compacted is important whether this thickness is 6 inches or 12 inches or 24 inches that will also determine amount of compaction now when proctor proposed this test which is called standard proctor test uh, he proposed a standard equipment which required a mold which has a standard size the volume of this mold is 1 over 30 cubic feet and in this mold we place soils in different layer and apply the mechanical energy by using a standard hammer and this standard hammer's weight is 5.5 pounds and drop is 12, 12 inches and the soil a certain water content is placed into three layers and each layer we apply 25 blow counts and the by using this hammer and once we have all the soil filled we level it we take the wet weight of this fill or the mold it should say wet weight and since we already know the water content we can calculate what is gamma sub d of the soil which we just compacted okay and that gives us one point on a relationship which is between water content and gamma d so we have single point we repeat these tests by taking the same amount of the so or same soil out adding some more water and it will give us another point third point fourth point fifth point and this relationship is called dry unit weight versus water content relationship and this is our goal uh, by conducting this test so in this test we place the soil into three layers in a standard mold we compacted 25 blow counts using standard ham hammer and we conduct this test for different water content and then we measure or plot a relationship between dry unit weight and water content now when proctor gave this test it was a standard test which was given 
and since then a larger amount of energy has been applied and why we apply that and this is called modified Proctor test and in that you can see that uh, hammer is heavier, drop is larger, we are placing soil in uh, five layers instead of three layers so we are among, applying almost three or four times more energy than standard Proctor test. Now why is it necessary? If you imagine in 1930s and 40s the type of construction equipment used as for the project, they were much smaller in size and they were capable of applying much smaller energy. Things have changed. Caterpillar and many companies have built now big air compactors and we are applying much larger energy. To simulate that field behavior, we need to model something and modify this proctor to standard proctor. Now some of you will also conduct tests in the lab using a reduced proctor where definitely energy is almost half the standard proctor and behavior would be different. Now let's look at a typical set of data. Okay, and this is very important to see that. We plot water content here and we plot dry density or dry unit weight. In your case, you will be plotting dry unit weight. And if we are doing a standard Proctor test, this is your relationship. And if we do modified Proctor test, then you can achieve much higher maximum dry, optimum dry density, we call optimum dry density, by applying greater amount of energy. But you can see when we have larger amount of energy, the water content at which this happened, which we call as optimum water content, reduced. Okay. So as we apply more and more mechanical energy, your maximum dry unit weight might increase, but optimum water content will decrease. So let me explain again what is the optimum water content. Optimum water content corresponds to maximum dry density. So for this data, this is our optimum water content. Okay. Now, as you can see, let's focus on this relationship. As we are increasing the water content, uh, the maximum dry density or dry density is decreasing. Means adding more water really doesn't make the structure to be com most compact. So it is really not a good effort to really add water. I also want to focus here a line which is called zero air void line. Uh, this really indicate that now there is no air left in the voids. Okay, or we can call that that hundred percent saturation line. Okay. Now, this also means that to get the maximum dry density or unit weight, you don't have to saturate the sample fully. Your sample can be partially saturated, yet it has maximum dry unit weight. Okay. I also want to point out if we join the points of maximum dry unit weight, this line is called, this dot line is called line of optimum. And this line, 100% saturation line, you can plot it, you will be plotting in your lab and you can also plot lines for 80% saturation and 60% saturation. And you can see that our maximum unit weight in both of the cases, our soil is are between 80 to 60% saturated, so it's not 100% saturated. It's important to note that different type of soils will have their unique relationship between gamma D and water content. So let's take a minute here to look at this data. So this data has, this figure has uh, data for silty sand, SM, uh, silt uh, and low plasticity silt, ML, and then silty clay which is CL and now we remember what these abbreviations really mean. If we look at this data, this silty clay material uh, has very kind of flat curve. Uh, silty silt and amyl, low plastic silt has much sharper peak and silty sand has a very distinct 
are in a very sharp and narrow and it's very easy to identify where is the line of optimum or of maximum dry unit weight. And if we plot this data for really a sand, it will also be a very, very flat curve. So it's important to remember that if you change anything in the soil, fine content, gradation, amount of silt, amount of sand, amount of gravel, it will change its relationship. Okay. Now, why do we really obtain these relationships? Because these, this is the information. If I'm going to use this soil as a fill in the field, this relationship about what is the maximum uh, dry unit weight, what is the optimum water content, this information I will use it to specify under what condition this soil should be compacted in the field. So this data is very important and when we select different type of fills, we perform these tests. These are conducted using ASTM standards and this data is used to specify or write specifications. Now I want to define an important term here is called relative compaction. So what is relative compaction? So relative compaction is a ratio between gamma D which is a dry unit weight achieved in the field over gamma D maximum which is maximum dry unit weight from standard or modified proctor which is done in the lab and this is I'm sorry this should be 100 but this is generally given as a percentage. Okay. Now what should be relative compaction? Uh, it really depends on your client sometimes it depends on the agency for example here are the typical relative compaction are required for different type of projects so if we look at fill to support building or roadway relative compaction minimum should be 90 percent if we are looking at upper 15 centimeter subgrade below roadway compaction relative compaction is 95 percent if we are looking at earth dam relative compaction could be 95 percent and so this is a ratio which we define for a given type of project. Now this is a very interesting uh, actually figure uh, and this brings some of the things which we have talked about under this section of clay mineralogy our chapter and what I like us to focus is on this chart or this figure which is really for uh, standard compaction. So this is our optimum water content. I'm going to write optimum water content and when the water, con water is lower than optimum we call this as a dry off optimum and when the water is more than optimum then we call it wet side of optimum. And I want you to look at here, this is called the fabric of soil and if you recall we talked about under the clay mineralogy section when particles have net attraction, so this is a net attraction, attraction. These particles are touching each other, so this is a flocculated structure, okay. And this structure is a very strong structure. It has higher shear strength, low compressibility, larger void ratio. Now if we look at the wet side of optimum, this structure is what we call more dispersed structure and where the particles have net repulsion, net repulsion. And this fabric results into a soil which has lower shear strength higher compressibility, lower void ratio, lower permeability and so this is very interesting by changing the water content we can have the same density unit weight but one side is dry of optimum other side is wet of optimum. This will have um, flocculated structure, this will have dispersed structure, this will have low shear strength low permeability 
let's see, right, not good handwriting, low permeability, uh, high compressibility compared to um, a dry site which will have high shear strength, low compressibility, high permeability. So this is very important information. Suppose I want to uh, construct a fill and it is a structure fill. It uh, will serve as a foundation for a building. So I definitely want this fill to be after compaction to be strong. It means higher shear strength, low compressibility. So in order to get that, I should be on the dry side of Optima. On the other hand, let's think about a project where I need to build a fill which should have low permeability because it is for a liner. And in that, I will be, should be in this case on the wet side of Optima because I want to have low permeability, okay? So keep this in mind that soils uh, depending on whether you are dry side of optimum or wet of side of optimum can have very different engineering properties. I think let's look at some data. Okay, this is, and you can find a lot of this data in a different kind of publication. So this study was done by lab in uh, 1958, okay, long, long time ago. And here is the compaction test data. Okay, so this is a standard compaction test, and here is the maximum dry density, and this may be the optimum water content. Let's assume this is around 14%. So around 14% we have is optimum water content, okay, because that corresponds to our maximum unit weight, all right? So on this top graph, they are plotting here permeability, soil permeability, and horizontal axis is water content. So this site where we have higher permeability, this is on dry side of Optima, soil structure is flocculated. So if I plot here flocculated structure, it would look like this. Okay, and when we come to the wet side of optimum, where permeability becomes 10 to the power minus seven, and this is on a wet side of optimum, and structure here is more dispersed. So what was done in the study, they performed uh, lots of compaction tests, and then they took the samples from here and here and here and here and conducted permeability tests, and this is what the data plotted here. And so you can see real evidence when the same soil is compacted on the wet side of optimum, it has lower permeability, and the when soil is compacted on dry side of optimum, it has a higher permeability. So things which we talked about in the using the pre previous uh, slide is not something hypothetical. It really happens in the soil, and we keep this thing in mind. So here is this typical soil liner being constructed. In addition to having the soil uh, low permeability, there are other uh, important criteria. Uh, and there was very interesting study done by Dave Daniel and uh, Greg Benson in 1999. And they suggested not only we need a requirement for low permeability zone, but we should have this fill material or liner material to have a good shear strength. And for good shear strength, we need to have be in our dry side of optimum. For low permeability, we should be on wet side of optimum. So they suggested there is acceptable zone where the soil, given type of soil, will meet both criteria, okay? So this is what we, when we have large uh, soil liner project uh, engineer, and in that case, you could be one of them. Uh, need to decide that to meet both shear strength and permeability criteria, what should be selected water content in the field. Now, I'm going to take a, a break and uh, come back to you um, and talk about then methods and equipment. Let me try to stop here and uh, see what we can do here before I can start recording 
uh, the next section.